over to you sir hello good evening everyone i am dr ritesh roy the webinar coordinator of aura the academy of regional anesthesia of india i welcome you all to this new webinar series the aura webinar series 2021 in association with uh, fuse film sonosite seeing the huge response uh, from our last webinar series we thought of starting uh, another webinar series which will be monthly once and uh, we are happy to have fuse film sonosite as a partner in this webinar series in the first webinar series we covered the basic part of regional anesthesia from head to toe covering almost all the blocks how to perform what are the indication complications in this webinar series it will be slightly different we will be touching upon some controversial topics some blocks which are still in question mark and uh, to have i am happy to have in this webinar series two very dynamic moderators and two dynamic speakers who are a well known personality internationally i have got dr murli thondibavi from bangalore and dr amjad maniar from bangalore as our moderator and dr bala venkat sir and dr tvs gopal sir as a speaker so not to waste your time we will just start with the academic session and please put your questions in the chat box in whichever channel you are viewing whether it's anesthesia tv whether it's a aura youtube channel or facebook just put your questions and every questions will be answered by our two speakers so over to dr murli thank you dr ritesh uh, good morning good evening to viewers uh, across various different channels from various parts of the globe welcome to the uh, new webinar series of aora and i'm extremely privileged and happy to introduce the first speaker of our series today it's none other than dr balavenkat subramaniam whose name is synonymous with regional anesthesia in india and across the world now if i were to go through the entire uh, cv and achievements of dr balavenkat it would take a lot of time so i'll just highlight a few things about him and all the various posts that he holds presently dr balavenkat subramaniam is a senior consultant and academic director at the department of anesthesia ganga medical center and hospitals in coimbatore he is presently the president of uh, asian oceanic society of regional anesthesia he is the educational committee member of the world federation of society of anesthesiologists he is a scientific committee member of the forthcoming world congress of anesthesia 2021 he is the national chairman of academy of regional anesthesia of india an associate editor of the journal of regional anesthesia and pain medicine he is the governing council member of the indian society of anesthesiologists a section editor of regional anesthesia for the indian journal of anesthesia he is the course editor course director for the escalap academy at ganga hospitals in coimbatore and also the post doctoral fellowship which is held uh, in the same hospital he is editorial board member of the journal of uh, research society of anesthesia and clinical pharmacology a national executive committee member of the international trauma care or indian chapter and a national general council member of the research society of anesthesia and clinical pharmacology now i'm sure all of you have guessed that if the post that he holds is this lengthy you can imagine the amount of orations the international lectures and the various publications that he has to his name so without uh, any de delay i would like to introduce uh, dr balavenkat subramaniam who will be speaking about how to make regional anesthesia a core component of perioperative care so as dr ritesh has already mentioned 
uh, you can post your questions and we will be taking the questions at the end of this session. Over to you, Dr. Bala. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murli Tonde Babi, for that very generous introduction. President of Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India, Dr. Vrushali Ponde, National Chairman, Dr. TVS Gopal, Dr. Sandeep Divan, Dr. Satish Kulkarni, the entire executive committee of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India, the two pleasant moderators of the day, Dr. Amjad Maniar and Dr. Murli, and the main person behind these webinars, the coordinator of the AYRA webinar series, the dynamic Dr. Ritesh Rai from Bhubaneswar, and all the participants of this webinar today from various parts of the globe. I bring to you greetings on behalf of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India and on behalf of the Ganga Medical Center and Hospital where I work. Today's topic is linked to a lot of introspection and what I'm going to submit to you today is what I felt on how to make regional anesthesia a core component of perioperative care. Before I begin, I'm extremely delighted and happy to say this is probably the first webinar officially after Awarae has celebrated a decade of pioneering work in regional anesthesia in India. And I take this opportunity to thank each and every member of Awarae, both the executive and the members of life members of Awarae, for helping us to promote safe practice of regional anesthesia in India. It's been a long journey, but it's a very fulfilling journey. And as we all know, as anesthesiologist, one of the most important thing is to take care of the pain and a pain-free surgery is what every patient wants when he enters the hospital for a surgical procedure. So we are truly the angels if we give them the opportunity to have a pain-free procedure. And I just wanted to highlight the AYRA pledge, which we took in 2019 conference Every delegate said, I hereby solemnly resolve that I will wipe out the pain and suffering of every patient and bring in brightness and smiles to every surgical patient. And we march with this pledge in mind. Every day you get into the operating room and 365 days a year to make sure that your core values are strong. If you have thought that every surgical patient needs to be pain-free. And if you want to succeed, I want to quote this, success is all about being in the process of joyfully creating a professional life that reflects your highest values, your deepest beliefs, and your greatest dream. And I'm sure everyone attending this session, the greatest dream will be to see a smiling patient at the end of a mutilating traumatic surgical procedure. And uh, how is that that would be possible? And the next 15 minutes, what I'm going to share with you is what I have learned in the process of making regional anesthesia as a component of perioperative care in the Ganga Hospital at Coimbatore. I'm happy to say that uh, currently the one building that you see on the right side is the new building. So in total, we have about 650 inpatient beds. We have 36 operating rooms and roughly on an average, including elective surgeries and emergency trauma surgeries, we operate anywhere between 100 to 150 surgeries per day. And I'm also extremely happy to say that we work as perioperative physician apart from acute pain service, also looking after the medical requirements 
of the patients. So we have only two divisions. One, the surgical division, which looks after the surgery. The other one is the anesthesia division, which looks after all the other aspects, including the physiology and the pathological changes that happens to the internal milieu in the perioperative period. And one of the accomplishments I'm extremely happy to share with you is to make pain relief a component of our perioperative care, both in the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. Uh, all these three aspects of pain which arises from the patient, we have addressed it. Now, when you want to make it as a component, did it happen on day one, which I joined in this institution? So it's 26th year of my work at Ganga Institute of uh, Ganga Hospital. And if I look back and introspect, there have been several challenges. And I'm going to address these challenges, which possibly could give some insight to several centers which would want to make regional anesthesia and analgesia an important component of their perioperative care. So preparing the anesthesiologist, number two, addressing the surgeon's concerns, third, creating the infrastructure, fourth, the patient's consent and the perspective, making RA a habit, establishing clear protocols and guidelines, and auditing the clinical work and seeing RB in the right track. These are the various uh, facets on which I'm going to enumerate. Preparing the anesthesiologist. We have four different categories. One, the senior anesthesiologists. Number two, the junior anesthesiologist consultant, junior consultants, registrars, fellows, and the postgraduates. If in an institution has to be capable of offering perioperative care and pain relief to every patient, it becomes pertinent and important that every single anesthesiologist who is working in this institution is capable of administering a block that is safe, that is appropriate, and that's effective. So for this, it is vital that we need to educate everyone based upon their requirement, the, everything about the anatomy, because it's got a clear effect on understanding the sono anatomy, everything about the equipment, the pharmacological agents and the adjuvants, and it becomes important, we create the habit of making everyone get updated by reading the journals, in watching the videos, making them attend webinars, and apart from that, having a regular curriculum. I think this is, crucial, important, and a structured curriculum is very, very essential to promote the knowledge and the know-how about every facet of regional anesthesia. I think I consider this as one of the most important aspect of making perioperative care of pain relief possible for every patient. And when we offer fellowships, we have one year and six months fellowship. It becomes very important that everyone has got an opportunity to present in their Saturday morning webinars, I mean, Saturday morning live seminars, and each one will get one hour to present their topic. And also there will be excellent discussions related to that particular topic with several questions coming in. Number one is this. Number two is enhancing the skill levels. This comes by practice, but also it's important when they join new, uh, we need to make them go through a process which includes needling in patients uh, who have already got a spinal, so they don't feel the pain, and also in blue phantoms. So skill levels enhancing becomes the next important aspect. The next thing which I consider very crucial is guidelines while giving the block. You need to meditate while you give the block. You should not speak because majority of the time the patient is awake and we cannot, we have a clear decorum while administering the block. 
and especially when someone else is administering the drug you you cannot raise your voice and say no 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 don't do this please give it slowly aspirate so these kinds of uh, statements make the patient very nervous uh, when the block is given so we prepared the anesthesiologist on how they need to behave while they give a block and a clear consensus about sedation if we need to give or not if the patient is anxious or not anxious or is it mandatory to give to every patient so a clear knowledge on what you need to do so my con my uh, opinion is until the patient is anxious i would want to keep the patient awake after explaining to the patient clearly on what we are doing and keep sedation as an sos otherwise i feel the best part of regional anesthesia is not or it it's defeated because the patient becomes drowsy need for oxygen supplementation possible post operative nausea and vomiting so this is something which is uh, very vital which uh, uh, important uh, to pass on the benefit of ra to the patient next is auditing the block efficacy and to make sure that we need to modify our strategies in few blocks if needed and most important thing is to teach everyone uh, how to handle a block failure is it you go for a, another block or whether you want to convert but a clear framework should be in the mind of the anesthesiologist the next important thing is in several units regional anesthesia and analgesia has not progressed because i think there has not been a clear understanding between the anesthesiologist and the surgeon and the surgeon has got always a concern whether his anesthetist will be able to do the block perfectly whether it is safe so he is very concerned about safety of the patient and more importantly on the efficiency of the block given and time taken to give the block in several units i realized that they take a long time to do the block and this has been uh, a reason why ra is not progressed or the surgeon doesn't allow the anesthetist to give the block in several units and he always measures the stop block block success surgeons are extremely happy when they repeatedly see that the block is very successful and also a surgeon wants us to follow up about the block given and the clear advice that you need to give for example when you do lower extremity block it becomes mandatory to explain to the patient that about ambulation and if you do upper limb you need to tell them on how to protect the surgeon wants us to take a complete responsibility about the block and the consequences and if we do this he allows us to give the block in every case and also it's important for us to know about compartment syndrome about pre existing neurological injuries and make sure that we never give a wrong side block this takes away the charm and takes away uh, the the surgeon's perspective about us as a regional anesthetist and patient care while doing the block he is surgeon is very concerned number of pricks that you give the the struggle that you do if he is observing you and uh, if he finds that you are not at ease in doing the block he says don't do the block so it's very very crucial that the surgeon needs to be extremely confident that you will be able to do the block perfectly efficiently with less time to allow you to get into a path where every case of his he will allow you to do the block and it's important to create a block room to prevent the surgeon from waiting and i think this is one of the important success uh, for giving um, for for the progress of regional anesthesia a dedicated procedure room is what uh, will decrease the time loss and next important thing is availability of the equipments availability of the ultrasound and the peripheral nerve stimulator around the clock availability of the needles drugs adjuvants all the time so slowly from one ultrasound machine now we have gone up to 12 ultrasound machines which is positioned in the block rooms of the four theater complexes that we have and also we have one machine in in the post operative ward and two circulating machines wherever it need be inside the operating room so availability becomes very important and the most important thing 
to make it as a component of perioperative care is availability of an anesthesiologist who can perform the block round the clock becomes very crucial for us in our hospital where we get patients day and night. And since we use the concept of on arrival block in trauma, it becomes pertinent whether it's day or whether it's night, the block is instituted. And in the post-operative period, if there is a rescue block that needs to be given for those patients who underwent surgery that particular day, it needs to be done at any point of time to make sure the chain is continued and it's not broken by the clock and by the time. So patients are concerned, and uh, this is another very important issue to be addressed by the anesthesiologist, uh, the perspectives of the patient. So you need to take him into complete confidence. We need to explain them lucidly about what you are doing. And most importantly, when we do the block, we have to assure absolute privacy for the patient to make sure that he accepts a block again later in life. And keeping professional discussions to minimum, I think uh, this is a, a, the fabric of a regional anesthetist. When he's performing the block on an awake patient, he has to keep his discussions to bare minimum, which will give enough confidence for the patient. And I spoke about conscious sedation. And now it becomes important to make uh, RA a habit as a part of every procedure. Now we have come to an era where every surgical procedure as a component of multimodal analgesia and as a component of intraoperative anesthesia and analgesia, RA has become uh, an integral part. So we need to addict the anesthetist and the surgeon to believe this and make it a habit to pass on the benefit to the patient and establishing clear protocols on what you would do in an institution where the number of blocks are high, it becomes important based on the dermatome, myotome, and osteotome requirement. Procedure specific blocks need to be performed on the patient so the block failures can be minimized. And uh, uh, the one of the things which will he help us to improve the efficacy is the auditing. And uh, I'll just go through a series of few slides, clinical slides, which makes us enthused to op offer this block to every patient. So RA is fascinating. So this is a person, uh, Anand Peter, who was supposed to do the live telecast of an orthoscopy workshop. At 8.20, he fell down. Nine o'clock, the live workshop has to start. He had a fractured dislocation of the wrist. So he had a subclavian perivascular block. At 8.40, it was reduced, pinned, and at 9 o'clock, he was able to sit and do the workshop. So this is the magic of regional anesthesia. And the same evening, once he finished the workshop, he went back home beaming. So this is the, this is the effect of um, the RA uh, in daycare and how it can make a injury very comfortable. And we often confront with dislocations, which are emergency. Patients are not um, in adequately prepared, ready for an anesthesia, like full stomach. So here, RA plays a crucial and vital role. And in hip fractures, I think uh, we make it an honorable block for hip fractures. And we, the PENG block, which we have found to be one of the most efficacious one, to make them offer the best pain relief. So whether it's day or night, the minute the patient arrives, they get a block. And also for positioning for anesthesia, like a combined spinal epidural would do the block. And fractured ribs are ones which are getting treated more by the anesthetist rather by the surgical team by offering excellent quality of analgesia. The erector spine anterior plane block, a continuous um, thoracic uh, paravertebral blocks all seem to be an answer for this. And as I said, in trauma, we have eight anesthesiologists working in the night to make sure every trauma patient gets a block. We found it to be extremely useful to make them comfortable. In fact, we have established a protocol that the block is given and only then they are investigated. Otherwise, a painful limb to go for an AP view and lateral view becomes very difficult. So block it, apply the tunicate if they are bleeding and then take them 
for uh, all kinds of investigations, including X-rays, and X-rays come out very well. And in our major surgical procedures like in replantation, we found that the surgical outcomes have been excellent because this block that was given preoperatively works intraoperatively and postoperatively, especially if you see the microsurgery that is going on. And we have found out adding dexamethasone seem to have improved the quality of surgical and postoperative analgesia phenomenally for up to 24 to 36 hours and also keeps the blood vessels dilated. So the microsurgical results are excellent. So these are the hip fracture patients who make them comfortable pain-free immediately. This is about the fractured ribs. In all the patients and the general anesthesia, we have made RA a component, whether it's a shoulder procedure, uh, whether it is the spine procedure, right from cervical spine up to the uh, sacrum, we have made sure that they get a regional anesthetic procedure. We have found extremely good results and fast tracking in these cases, like scoliosis surgery, which needed a lot of post-operative sedation with the use of uh, four quadrant uh, erector spinal block. We have found that the requirements are less and their ability to generate a good tidal volume has been good. Other big challenges are orthroplasties, and we have found extremely good result with the dual subsartorial plexus block. And uh, we also gone in for perineural catheters for major procedures like total shoulder, total hip replacements. And this is what I spoke about scoliosis. When you go for anterior approach, we have started using the erector spinae block effectively in these procedures. And we also come across a lot of patients who come with chronic um, uh, post-surgical uh, pain syndrome, CRPS, and we have found using perineural catheters have been extremely useful to them. So in short, when they come in preoperatively, if it's a trauma case, immediately they get a block and they're made pain free. If it's for an elective procedure, preemptively we do preemptive analgesia by doing the block. For example, all spine surgeries, a ESP block before they put the incision. And we found that intraoperative requirements of anesthetic agents are less, opioid consumption are less. And third, we make uh, the regional block as a component of multimodal postoperative analgesia to make sure that the recovery is excellent. And by these methods, we have made sure that we offer pain services, pain relief services completely in the perioperatively, and the benefit seems to be huge. Early return to normalcy, a sense of well-being, participation in physiotherapy, early ambulation, decreased respiratory complication easy movement of bowels because they walk to the restroom. And the most important thing is good sleep, good appetite, sense of well-being, a positive attitude towards life when they are facing the surgical uh, stress. So apart from the neuroendocrine and decrease in the stress response which RA offers, all that I've discussed has made RA an inherent component of perioperative care. And every anesthesiologist who uses this tool appropriately would offer the best possible uh, comfort to the patient when he needed the most. I am sure that this would become the norm for every surgical patient henceforth globally, made easy with the use of ultrasound. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. And I deem it a great privilege for the opportunity given to discuss on how to make regional anesthesia a co-component of every surgical patient. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, sir, for the elaborate talk. Uh, I'm just checking the uh, various chat rooms. Uh, we don't seem to have any questions, uh, but I had one uh, which I thought many would probably would want to ask. Now, you have trained many anesthetists in regional anesthesia. They have moved to different parts of the globe and you're in constant touch with them. Now, are there any common reasons that people are not able to establish the practice of on arrival block in their specific centers? And if so, what are the reasons and what do you think is a solution to make sure that in another five to 10 years, uh, any patient arriving into the emergency will be able to get an on-arrival block. 
Um, to answer the question, this is something which uh, has cropped up many times. One of the most important things is the protocol that you establish on administering the block. Many of them wanted to do it in the emergency room and an anesthesiologist is not available in an emergency room in most of the institutions. So the easiest solution, what we have done is the minute the trauma victim comes to the hospital, in the emergency room he's seen and the next he's immediately seen by an anesthesiologist in the block room which is an anteroom to the operating theatre. And the X-ray machine, ultrasound, everything is there in that uh, position. And every institution has got anesthesiologist who's covering the duty. So in his, his domain, under his control, under safe atmosphere, the block is given. And uh, as I showed, the X-rays are only performed after that. So the simplest solution is to change the way the patient is shifted. Uh, I think uh, that will make sure that uh, because anesthetist is available around 24 hours round the clock. So it's easy to do it uh, under his supervision in the place where it's very safe to do it rather than doing it in an emergency department. Thank you, sir. Another question probably which people would like to ask is many centers uh, probably lack the equipment uh, to give a PNS guided or an ultrasound guided block. Now, what is your take on using infiltration and analgesia of local anesthetic, especially by the surgeons at the end? Because that, that is also a form of regional anesthesia. So what is your take on that, especially in areas where they don't have access to equipment? No, the, this is right. Actually, uh, many of the doctors say that machines are available in the daytime and it's not available in the night. It's kept under lock and key. That's why uh, if, they, if they change the concept of where the block is given and the equipments are under the control of anesthesiologist, this can definitely be done even in the night. That's number one. Number two, infiltration, LIA technique. Yes, to a certain extent, this could be done. But then we know that it will not take care of all the aspects of pain. The pain generators are there in several layers. And you are just looking after or taking care of just few of the pain generators, but it's still better than nothing. But I don't think the way we are moving forward, that would be the real uh, solution. Uh, we need to uh, scale up and see how we can do these blocks even in the night. Sure, so thank you. We have one question from Dr. Gaurav PR, uh, who's asking, is there any role of bilateral upper limb blocks? Yeah, actually the, the one which I showed was uh, bilateral uh, actually, it was a 10 finger replant. So one side, uh, it was above the clavicle and one side, it was below the clavicle block. Two teams operating at the same time. And uh, yes, it is possible and it can be done. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. I think sir, we don't uh, have any uh, more. Yeah, I, uh, sir, I have uh, uh, one question. I think uh, many of the anesthetists will. Uh, the main hindrance which you have covered is that the surgeons are reluctant to start the regional anesthesia. They are the main person who don't want the regional anesthesia to be administered, either because of the cost concern, because of the time <coughs> concern. So when I want to know your experience, obviously when you started, obviously there must be some reluctance from the surgeon. So how did you make them understand? Because that is uh, that will be helpful in in many of the anesthetists who want to start regional anesthesia, how to take care of that surgeon factor? We want to know um, your experience. See, I think the, the, the bottom line is it should be an effective block, uh, Ritesh. So if they are convinced that you are going to give a very effective block and they are seeing the effect of it in the post-op, with a patient who is smiling with less pain and thanking the surgeon for such an excellent uh, quality of pain relief. I think this, that is the simple, single most important component when a surgeon will think, yes, the block is working. The problem has been because of inadequate block, block failures. And I think the, the I think I would probably take uh, the blame on ourselves for not giving them the good results, that's, that's the main thing which made them think that the blocks don't work. The minute you start proving that it's very effective, 100% they are going to say yes to us. 
answer one more question. Uh, suppose you have given a block and a nerve injury happens. So how to take care how to take care of that situation, how to understand the patient, how to convince your surgeon, because there, right now we are doing good number of blocks, obviously that situation, somebody can land it. How to scatter that situation, how to take care of that situation? One of the first and important things I would want to say is uh, nerve injuries due to the blocks are much, much less than actually what we think. That's number one. There are several other factors which result in post-operative uh, persistent uh, neurological uh, recovery is not adequate. So majority of the times we know it's because of neuropraxia, but we need to have a clear protocol and we, can, we have to discuss with the surgical team. And that's why it's very important to note the neurology of every single patient before administering the block, either for a pre-existing clear neurological injury or a possible double crush, which can happen when you instituted the block. So this becomes mandatory. And number two is with confidence, taking the surgeon into confidence, it has to be approached together. Most of the time it's neuropraxia, if not, then we need to do the clear protocol of nerve conduction study. And here again, what I would want the most, it can happen, but the most important thing is the surgeon anesthesiologist relationship in handling this issue. Uh, here is where I think we will win the war and give the best to the patient. Thank you, sir. Murri, sir, over to you. So I think we have answered most of the questions. Uh, we have a few questions regarding basics of regional anesthesia, which I think we will take in the subsequent webinars on similar topics. So I request uh, Dr. Amjad Manyar to kindly take over the uh, mic and introduce Dr. TBS Kopal in the next uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bala, sir, uh, for enlightening us. It was just a wonderful talk. And I hope uh, all the uh, anesthetists will now ma start making pain an integral part of their perioperative care and give a happy smile to all the patients. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Ritesh. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ritesh and Murri. Uh, our next speaker once again requires no introduction, and I have been given the arduous task of trying to introduce him to our audience. Dr. TVS Gopal is the head of the Department of Anesthesia and the Associate Medical Director at Care Hospitals in Hyderabad. He is also the founder director of Axon Anesthesia Associates, which is India's largest group anesthesia practice. Dr. Gopal's interests extend beyond regional anesthesia and onto fields like liver transplant, anesthesia for cardiac, vascular surgery, and trauma. He is a well-known and an able administrator. He is also a DNB and regional anesthesia fellowship instructor. Closer to regional anesthesia, Dr. Gopal was introduced to ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia way back in 2006. And he was one of the founders of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia and has been the chairman as well as a past president. Dr. Gopal has lectured extensively nationally as well as internationally. He runs a popular advanced regional anesthesia and ultrasound course in Hyderabad. He has taught, pioneered and published in regional anesthesia, but his greatest legacy has been his ability to champion the cause of regional anesthesia as well as mentor several generations of anesthesiologists. Dr. Gopal today will be taking a very critical look at the erector spinae block. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce him to this audience. Over to you, Dr. Gopal. Good evening to all the viewers in India and um, a hearty welcome to viewers across the globe. Thank you, Anja, for your uh, very kind words of introduction. Two weeks ago, when Amjad 
called me uh, to disclose the title of my talk, I had just one question to ask myself, why me? Um, the talk is erectile spinae blocks for anterior truncal surgeries. And that ends in a question also, has the time come to speculate? And uh, the very concise answer is yes, the time has come to speculate. And over the course of my lecture, we will see why and how. The mantra of an ultrasound-guided nerve block is to place the needle in the vicinity of the nerve and inject local anesthetic solution, subsequent to which the patient experiences a sensory block involving the cutaneous, musculofacial, and osteal territories corresponding to that nerve. And thankfully, there is a predictable relationship between the local anesthetic and the ensuing sensory block. I make this point because with interfascial plane blocks, this predictability is not always assured. When it comes to extensive surgeries involving the thoracic cavity or the abdominal cavity, uh, for several decades now, the gold standard has been the thoracic epidural and in some instances, the equally invasive thoracic paravertebral block. But there are certain uh, circumstances when uh, the performance of either of these can be technically challenging or in some instances, not even permissible. So that leaves a lacuna as far as application of regional analgesia for control of postoperative pain is concerned. 2007 was a landmark year uh, because the ultrasound guided transversus abdominis plane block was introduced into clinical practice. This is essentially an interfascial plane block. And at that time, this became the most performed and also the most studied interfascial plane block. Um, the current definition of fascia is that it is a sheet, a sheet or any other dissectable aggregations of connective tissue that attach, enclose and separate muscles and other organs. Uh, broadly speaking, fascia is classified into superficial, deep and um, visceral. And um, it is the deeper, denser layer of deep fascia that is pertinent to the performance of interfascial plane blocks. At that time, the transversus abdominis plane block was immensely popular and that set off the opening of floodgates. And over the next few years, several other newer interfascial plane blocks of the trunk came into clinical practice. Fascia, as we all know, is a complex structure. And uh, from a functional perspective, it uh, offers force transmission and stabilization during movement, which is why uh, fascia tends to glide over each other. Facial planes communicate. Fascia can be classified as epimysial or upper neurotic. And it is innovated by somatic and sympathetic nerves. And last but not the least, fascia is perforated by arteries, veins, and nerves, and is not impermeable to the spread of local anesthetic. So all of these components of facial structures affect the dispersion of local anesthetic when we perform an interfacial plane block. This was a landmark publication by Forero, uh, Kijin, and colleagues in September 2016, which set the world of regional anesthesia literally on fire. The authors uh, spoke of their experience with a novel new interfascial plane block, which they call the erector spinae plane block. And they spoke of their experiences with four patients two of whom had thoracic neuropathic pain. And in two patients, they used this block 
to curtain acute post-surgical pain. Um, I've just put up these uh, pictures here. On the left is the uh, cutaneous spread in the first volunteer. It spreads almost from the anterior midline to the posterior midline, just lateral to the anterior midline, going, stopping just short of the posterior midline. In the second volunteer, the anterior posterior coverage is pretty much the same, but you will see that the axilla has been spared. I put up the slide to let you know that in the first publication itself, in four patients, there was a variability as far as the extent of sensory blockade was concerned. And this is a 3D reconstruction of uh, <clears throat> the spread of local anesthetic by the same authors. You can see that from the point of insertion, which was T5, there was extensive craniocardite spread. And the yellow or I mean arrows depict that the in local anesthetic has been going beyond the costal transfers junction anteriorly. Uh, this is a, a short video clip of an erectile spinae block I performed. You can see the needle making contact with the transverse process and the spread of local anesthetic. It was fondly believed that this very useful block as it was surmised at that time, and even now we do think it is uh, immensely beneficial. Uh, as far as interfacial plane blocks are concerned, the trifecta was achieved, which is simplicity, safety, and effectivity. And naturally, uh, there was near mass hysteria, and uh, there was a deluge of publications eulogizing the virtues of um, the potential for uh, the mechanisms of actions of and the clinical applications for this particular block. Today, there are more than 600 PubMed records to date and um, an overwhelming percentage, which is 90%, um, is uh, something that pertains to case reports, mini case series, observational studies. About 6% are cadaveric studies and only approximately 2.5% are randomized controlled trials. And in 90% of clinical studies, the primary endpoint has been the duration and quality of perioperative analgesia. The superiority of the erectile spinae plane block was sought to be established by comparing it with a no block or a sham block. And when the erectile spinae plane block was compared with other facial plane blocks, the data was not very encouraging. Now, this was a um, um, meta-analysis of 860 patients belonging to 30 13 randomized controlled trials. And all of these patients underwent breast surgeries. And when the ESP was compared with a no block, no prizes for guessing that the quality of analgesia was great. And when compared to a PEX2 block, it was inferior. And surprisingly, these authors concluded rather cautiously that the efficacy of the ESP was similar to that of the thoracic paravertebral block. And um, this was another meta-analysis of a similar number of patients who underwent uh, a variety of thoracic and abdominal surgeries. And the authors concluded that there is moderate quality evidence that erectile spinae plane block is an effective strategy to improve post-surgical analgesia. Um, when we come to clinical applications, besides uh, the attempt to curtail postoperative pain and offer relief uh, to patients with chronic pain syndromes, it has also made its way into emergency room um, 
And uh, it is performed on arrival for patients with, uh, say, rib fractures or spine fractures or renal colics or burns or acute pancreatitis and so on. So all these uh, indications have been reported in the literature. Um, about 25% of all publications concerning the ESP block emanate from Turkey. And in this uh, single center in Istanbul, uh, you can see that the ESP has been offered for post-op analgesia for a variety of surgical procedures, uh, starting with shoulder arthroscopies and going all the way down to knee surgeries. So by about 2019, erectile spinae block was firmly established as a magic bullet for postoperative analgesia. A question that we are often asked is, can surgical anesthesia be achieved with the erectile spinae plane block? Um, an extensive review of literature would lead me to say, no, probably not. But this one article uh, from Jaipur in India bucked the common trend. These authors, had their surgeons perform mastectomies in 30 patients with just an erectile spinae plane block. 25 mils of 0.5% bupivacaine admixed with eight milligrams of dexamethasone was given to these patients. None of these patients were converted to general anesthesia. They were put on a TIVA with propofol. One mic per kg of fentanyl was administered for additional systemic analgesia and they were given oxygen as a supplementation. This is quite surprising because there is no other case series uh, which says that the erectile spinae plane block can be used for complete surgical anesthesia of an anterior truncal surgery. Right from the day of its inception into clinical practice, the erectile spinae plane block has been plagued by certain problems. Firstly, inconsistency, I mean, sorry, firstly, inconsistency as far as the dermatomal segment involvement is concerned. That is, there is a great variation in the cranial and cordage spread from the point of insertion of the needle and deposition of local anesthetic. More importantly, there is a great discordance between the extent of cutaneous sensory blockade when compared to the duration and quality of analgesia. And finally, the mechanism of action remains elusive and possibly in the realm of hypotheses. Um, in 2019, Vishal and Vivian Ip wrote thus in their article, any novel intervention should be rigorously tested for efficacy prior to widespread application and adoption into clinical practice. And very rightly, they caution that the overriding factor for the popularity of a block should not be the simplicity of its performance. This was a scathing critique by Longquist, uh, Karmakar, and colleagues, uh, during which they said that in the absence of a definitive mechanism of action, this block should be laid to rest, but it's too early to do that. Uh, this was a wonderful article by Kijin and Bob Dardley, a recent publication in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, wherein the authors sought to offer insights into the mechanism of action of the erectile spinae plane block. And whenever we look at the mechanism of action of a new block, we are guided by cadaveric studies, animal studies, studies on human volunteers, and radio contrast imaging of the injected in live subjects. There are approximately 20 different cadaveric studies evaluating the spread of injectate following uh, the deposition of local anesthetic, I mean, the dye into the uh, space. And uh, with the exception of 
a few uh, catalysts, by and large, these studies um, conclude that there is no anterior spread into the thoracic paravertebral space uh, to sustain uh, the ventral ramus of the uh, nerve with the dye. But there are certain issues with cadaveric studies that we must consider. In an embalmed cadaver, we do know that the tissues are not as pliable. And the process of thawing a frozen cadaver from its storage temperature of minus 20 degrees centigrade uh, affects the tissue integrity of that particular cadaver. By and large, we tend to use methylene blue, which is an aqueous dye, and it has been accused of having a propensity to have a wider spread. On the other hand, a viscous dye by the addition of, say, latex or resin probably underestimates spread. The level of experience of the person who is performing the cadaveric dissection is very, very crucial because if you are not dissecting in the right plane, you will not pick up the spread of dye at all. And in most cases, we are looking at naked eye visibility of the dye, which probably again underestimates the spread. And most importantly, uh, a cadaveric study cannot replicate the conditions that exist in a living subject. Fascia and muscles tend to tense and relax. Facial planes glide over one another. There is rise and fall of intrathoracic and intra-abdominal cavity pressures. And all of these factors do have a bearing on the ultimate location of local anesthetic after it's been injected into an interfascial plane. So the foremost theory that Keegan and Bogdadli uh, give us in their uh, enlightening article is physical spread of the local anesthetic. In the picture on the left, you see that the needle has made contact with the transverse process, and this is the local anesthetic there. These two arrows depict craniocordax spread, which we all agree with, and we see each time we do an erectile spinal plane block. And this arrow depicts anterior spread towards the thoracic paravertebral space. Now, in this particular picture, you see that the local anesthetic is deposited here. This arrow depicts posterior spread to block the dorsal ramus. This arrow depicts lateral spread into the intercostal space. This arrow depicts anterior spread to block the ventral ramus. And this particular arrow depicts medial spread towards the intervertebral foramen and the epidural space. So these are all the possible directions in which the local anesthetic may spread from the point of injection. So if you see this particular picture, the needle has made contact with the transverse process, and this is the local anesthetic, which is spread in the craniocordate direction, just anterior to the erector spinae muscle. Now, this local anesthetic is separated from the thoracic paravertebral space by a host of connective tissue. Primarily, you have the laminar transverse ligament, the intertransverse ligament, the superior costal transverse ligament, uh, deep muscles of the back, such as the liver torus costero, and the interligament pad of fat. Collectively, all this connective tissue is referred to as the intertransverse connective tissue complex. It is important to note that this particular tissue complex is impermeable to the spread of local anesthetic by bulk flow along a pressure gradient, but it is not impermeable to diffusion of local anesthetic along a concentration gradient, which is a much slower process. In addition, just medial to the superior costal transverse ligament is the costal transverse foramen through which the dorsal ramus exits posteriorly accompanied by an artery and a vein. 
And this serves as an additional conduit for spread of local anesthetia towards the anterior segment, which is where the paravertebral space would lie. And as I said earlier, when the erector spinae muscle contracts, it pushes the drug anteriorly and the negative intrathoracic pressure, which is in the pleura, draws the local anesthetic towards it. So these are the hypotheses which tend to explain the physical spread of local anesthetic. Now, as per this particular study in human volunteers, you can see that the extent of cutaneous sensory blockage exhibits great variability. So there is unpredictable sensory blocking, and there are certain factors which can explain this. First and foremost is the technical factor. When you look at the erector spinae muscle, the median most aspect of the erector spinae muscle attaches itself to the transverse processes by way of tendinous insertions. These tendinous insertions become thicker and larger as we move from the thorax to the lumbar spaces. So when your needle is within the tendon, no matter what you do, you will not be able to inject against resistance. And on the other hand, when your needle is within the epimyceum of the erector spinae muscle, you will see a craniocardiac spread of local anesthetic, but your block will not work. The second aspect is the propensity of local anesthetic to bring about differential neural blockage. We do know that the smaller A delta fibers that subserve fast pain and the smaller C unmyelinated fibers that subserve slow pain or second pain are blocked preferentially in comparison to the larger A alpha or A beta fibers, which subserve um, mechanosensation or proprioception. So this can explain why the quality of analgesia exceeds the extent of cutaneous sensory blocking. And deep pain also is preferentially blocked and deep pain usually emanates from the muscles, the tendons, ligaments, or the viscera. And finally, cutaneous innovation does not always follow the pattern of the typical, um, uh, you know, the maps which depict your cutaneous uh, innovation in textbooks show. Uh, sometimes uh, these nerves uh, interconnect with each other by way of uh, cutaneous plexuses, and that also could be a reason why there is an unpredictable sensory blocking. Now, um, the last few slides. Uh, when you come to the lumbar uh, uh, space, there is a fat-filled compartment where you would deposit your local anesthetic. And this fat-filled compartment is in continuity with the fat-filled compartment that accompanies lumbar nerves, the lumbar spinal nerves. And this explains why when you do a lumbar ESP, there is analgesia for surgical procedures of the hip or the femur. And similarly, when you do a high ESP between say C6 and T2, there is communication or spillover of local anesthetic to affect the ventral rami of C5 to C8, as also the dorsal scapular nerve, the suprascapular nerve, and the long thoracic nerve which is why there is good analgesia for surgeries that involve the shoulder girdle. This is a very interesting hypothesis. People often ask, is the erector spinae plane block a systemic local anesthetic by proxy? When you do an ESP, you tend to inject a large mass of local anesthetic bordering close to the maximal recommended limits in a confined space with a reasonable vascularity. It is quite likely that this local anesthetic is absorbed systemically to achieve therapeutic local anesthetic concentrations, and that is probably why you have excellent analgesia. 
Longquist and colleagues suggested that whenever a study is conducted prospectively to test the efficacy of the ESP block, we must also have a group of patients in whom there will be a systemic local anesthetic infusion alone. This will tell us whether uh, the ESP is superior to this group or not in terms of quality of analgesia. A case in point is when you put in a catheter after doing an ESP block, you will notice that your block works very well when you do a programmed intermittent bolus with the catheter in situ. And uh, this particular study by Philip McCare and colleagues from Vietnam reinforces that point. Uh, they conclude that a program intermittent bolus improves opioid sparing post-op analgesia in pediatric patients after open cardiac surgery. Now, in this particular study, they've shown that there is a medial spread into the epidural space. Though the spread may not be always in physically detectable amounts, nevertheless, there could be sufficient local anesthetic concentrations in the milieu surrounding the spinal nerves, the dorsal root ganglia, and the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, thereby not only preventing nociceptive transmission, but also inhibiting central sensitization in the dorsal horn. Uh, this is a, quite a fancy study that was performed in uh, uh, carcasses of pigs. And the authors noted that there was no spread anteriorly into the thoracic paravertebral space, but they saw that the prevertebral lymph node and the posterior intercostal lymph node were stained with uh, the dye. And these authors wanted us to consider that possibly a lymphatic spread can explain the mechanism of action of an ESP. At this point of time, this remains a fancy hypothesis which is yet to be proven. And um, we do know that the erector spinae group of muscles are innervated by the thoracolumbar fascia, which are rich in sympathetic neurons, mechanoceptors, and nociceptors. There is a theory which states that the uh, very good analgesia and the cutaneous sensory blockage is because these particular receptors are blocked. At this point of time, again, there is no evidence to support this hypothesis. So finally, in conclusion, let us summarize what I just spoke. Does the erector spinae plane block give good analgesia perioperatively? Yes, it does. Given the strength of evidence, barring one article which I spoke about, no. Can this block be used for multiple clinical applications? Apparently, yes. Is there always an anterior spread of local anesthetic to block the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve? At this point of time, um, we are quite uncertain about that. Are the actions of the ESP brought about by systemic absorption of local anesthetic? It is a hypothesis that we must not dismiss. So I will say possibly. And finally, must we lay this uh, particular block to rest? Certainly not. It is too premature. This block has been around for less than five years. And I sincerely believe that any prospect of studies in the future must concentrate on demystifying the mechanism of, of action of this block so that it will have its rightful place in the armamentarium of blocks that we can offer to our patients. Uh, thank you very much for your um, hearing. Uh, over to you, Amjad. Thank you, Dr. Gopal, for that uh, absolutely profound uh, look at the erector spinae block. Uh, we have one question from Dr. Abdul Nazar, and he asks if we find any difference in analgesia between the erector spinae plane block and the quadratus lumborum block. 
that would be as far as abdominal surgery is concerned, right? Yes. Um, I would say that as far as abdominal uh, surgeries are concerned, um, there are far more reports in favor of the quadratus lumborum block than the erector spinae block. But to the best of my knowledge in the literature, I have not come across a study which compared the two of these. So I would not be able to answer that uh, question. I, I leave it open to uh, Ritesh or Murali or you to uh, offer your comments. Uh, <clears throat> what you said is uh, absolutely right, sir. We have not gone, seen any literature uh, which has compared ESP with uh, QL. Sir, uh, uh, my question uh, is in your clinical practice, uh, we know that for abdominal surgery, we have been using the epidurals, which give an absolutely very nice post-operative pain relief. Have you replaced the epidural with erector spinae catheters for the abdominal surgeries? I mean, you're asking if I combined an epidural with an ESP no. catheter? No, no, no. Have you, for the open laparotomies, we have been using epidurals throughout our life. Yes. Have you replaced oh, epidural? No. no, I have not. I, um, as you heard from my previous lectures, um, I am quite a proponent of the thoracic epidural. I believe that it is far more simpler to place a single catheter than have two catheters in place and thereby two uh, infusion pumps going on the patient. Um, I personally have not replaced uh, the epidural with uh, bilateral ESP catheters. Dr. Gopal, have you, uh, in your extensive research for this topic, have you come across what the success rate of facial plane blocks, especially something like the quadratus lumborum block in delivering analgesia? We know blocks like femoral block has been quoted sometimes of having a success rate as much as 100%. But with facial plane blocks, is there any sort of number quantifying their success rate? Because we often burn our hands on this block. We do it and everything looks good visually, but it just doesn't seem to deliver the analgesia that we expect it to at times. So are there certain numbers defined? No. Um, I would request you to, I mean, all of you to read this particular article which uh, appeared in Anesthesia and Analgesia very recently. It was by Stecco, Black and Vincent Chan. And uh, the title is uh, Facial Plane Blocks, More Questions Than Answers. And uh, one of the points that the authors raise in that particular talk, I mean, lecture is, as on day, there is no definition of a successful or a failed interfacial plane block. So unless you can have a proper definition to say, okay, this is a successful uh, interfacial plane block or this is not, you are unlikely to have any percentages in terms of success or failure. So that is a very good article, which I would uh, request all of you to uh, find and read. I think that uh, what you just said also harps on the fact that not all facial plane blocks can provide uh, a little bit of surgical anesthesia. We know that the TAP block, we can achieve some degree of it for, say, inguinal hernia surgeries. But beyond the lower abdomen, it is a big question mark whether the surgical anesthesia can be defined. We have defined success of a block, say, with the brachial plexus, with the ability to provide 
surgical anesthesia. It's, it's a very clear cut phenomenon, but we are unable to do this with the facial plane block. So uh, Dr. Nazar has a comment saying, we find the QL very good for lower abdominal surgeries like the cesarean uh, and open hysterectomy uh, kind of surgeries. So I think there isn't too much difficulty providing lower abdominal analgesia as compared to upper abdominal and uh, thoracic analgesia with uh, interfacial planes. Uh, Dr. Sugatri has asked, can we use an additive like dexamethasone in the ESP block? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, again, the role of additives in interfacial plane blocks, leave alone the ESP, um, has not yet been defined. Um, as per the FDA guidelines, it still remains, um, uh, it's not approved yet, the use of an additive for any perineural block for that matter. So if you go back to looking at the study that was published from JPO, now, why do you think that they were able to do 30 mastectomies without resorting to GA? They used eight milligrams of dexamethasone. So did dexamethasone do the trick? We don't know. Or was the trick performed by putting the needle inadvertently past the transverse process and injecting into the thoracic paramedic full space? Now that is another question we need to ask. So to answer her question, whether it makes a difference or not, I really don't know. Dr. Saxena asks, between the PENG, the QL, and the ESP, which one would you choose or opt for in cases of hip surgeries? It's so much simpler. And when I do a PENG, I don't need to put the patient in any other position but supine. I don't need to flex the hip. I don't need to flex the knee. So I think that offers patients uh, more comfort in terms of positioning. It's a more superficial block. The end point is easier to determine. And all you need to do is put in a large volume of local anesthetic. And then you can see the patient up for uh, a spinal or epidural. So uh, if you compare the thoracic ESP and the lumbar ESP, uh, is there any difference in the spread of a single injection in thoracic and lumbar? Yes, if you read uh, Keegan's article, you will see that uh, there are two points which they mention. One, um, the tendinous insertions of the medius, medial most muscles, which in the lumbar space would be the multifidus because the semispinalis would have ended uh, by, say, T12. So these tendinous insertions are thicker and larger. So they've actually uh, shown a CT image wherein they believe that you should go a little more laterally and inject in the plane between the ESP and the QL. So in that sense, if you go a little more laterally, you will not be within the tendinous insertion and you will be able to find the plane much better, they say. But in that case, you're actually very close to potentiating a QL block. So I don't know where the uh, demarcation lies between the two when you do a lumbar ESP. I think we'll take one last question. Uh, this is from Dr. Shaji. If the ESP has systemic absorption as one of its possibilities of providing analgesic effects, is there any specific local anesthetic that we should be using? Again, if you go to uh, Cajun's article, they are a great pains to emphasize that when you talk of systemic absorption of local anesthetic, all the studies are on lignocaine, 
But when you do an ESP block, you don't use lignocaine. You use either ropivacaine or bupivacaine. But then to dismiss this theory becomes difficult because have you had any other block prior to this wherein you had to give a program intermittent bonus for your block to succeed? If you give a basal infusion of local anesthetic, you see that the ESP is not as successful. So that probably is a case in point that you need that large mass of local anesthetic to be injected intermittently so that it's absorbed into the systemic circulation. So studies will have to be done in the future prospectively on the use of ropivacaine and bupivacaine and looking at the plasma therapeutic concentrations and how long that plasma therapeutic concentration lies, I mean stays, or how soon it decays. So I think that will give us uh, more uh, pointers on whether this is a major source of analgesia or whether there is something else. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Ritesh, I'll leave it to you to end the uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bala, sir. Dr. TVS, sir, for a wonderful uh, lecture and a wonderful discussion. I think uh, it's a eye-opener uh, for uh, many people. By Bala, sir, talk how to make pain an important component in their perioperative care. And people who have not started doing it, now they should think and start doing it because you always, what we want is a smiling face of the patient post-operative. And TBS, sir, obviously it was a topic which I and Amjad had a discussion that it's none other than TBS, sir, who will speak on it. And uh, thank you, sir, for a nice deliberation on it. Thank you, Amjad. Thank you, Murli, sir, for a wonderful moderation. Thank you, Rahul, thank you, Anastasia TV, and thank you, Fusifilm, for your association with our webinar. Thanks to all the delegates across the globe for joining. People who want to have more questions, they are free to put in our Facebook page, in our Aura YouTube channel. It will be answered. And we will be continuing our webinar series every month and uh, see you all next month. Thank you very much. Take care, be safe, bye-bye. And uh, come be part of the Aura, be part of the Aura family. Bye-bye, take care, bye.